Good afternoon, and welcome to the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit uh, webinar on the ins and outs of ACE Military Credit Evaluation. My name is Sarah Appel, and I'm the MCMC Project Coordinator for the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. And we couldn't do the work without uh, our sponsors. Special thanks to Lumina Foundation and USA Funds. A uh, basic overview, the mission of the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit is to facilitate an interstate partnership of 13 states and to translate competencies acquired by veterans through military training and experiences toward college credentials. States will exchange information and share best practices in the areas of articulation of credit, certification and licensure, communication, and data and technology. Our project goals, our overall arching goal is to assist student veterans with completing post-secondary education and the transition into civilian employment. We also have the following three goals that support this. Assist with critical life transitions from the military to post-secondary education, and then from post-secondary education to civilian employment. Increase post-secondary education completion rates by creating models for the consistent, transparent, an effective awarding of credit for military training and experience that can be scaled regionally and nationally, thereby lowering the cost of education and reducing the time to completion. And number three, establish a strong network of support, communication, documentation, and data collection among institutions and organizations for the purpose of promoting shared interests and tracking the FC of efforts to enhance service members' educational success. This, is primary, this work is primarily done by our four work groups, the articulation of academic credit, licensure and certification, communication and outreach, data systems and technology. Today's moderators are from the articulation of academic credit co-chairs and I will let them introduce themselves. Katie, I'll go first, I guess. Uh, my name is Jim Craig. I'm from the University of Missouri in St. Louis, and we're happy. It looks like a huge group, so we're happy to have all of you. Uh, Katie, you're up. Yeah, thank you. I'm Katie Giardello. I'm the Director of Veteran and Transfer Initiatives with the Michigan Center for Student Success. And a major part of my job is to coordinate the grant-funded activities of the Consortium of Michigan Veterans Educators. So first and foremost, I want to say hello to all of my CMBE people out there. And just to spread some love around, it's Valentine's Day, so I want to just let you all know that I love that you're taking time out of your day to join us in discussing this important topic. Um, I can't say how much I enjoy being engaged with the MCNC group. These are passionate, dedicated professionals that I really, truly enjoy collaborating with, especially my co-chair, Jim, and our fearless leader at MEC, Sarah. Our goals with our committee, uh, our work group, the Articulation of Academic Credit focus area, is to facilitate information sharing and dialogue to make awarding credit for military competencies easier for everyone on the campuses. You can see the articulated goals related to our grant projects on the screen before you. Mm -hmm. um, but in the interest of throwing some love around again, I want to throw some right at the American Council on Education. I know the folks there hold some of the keys to unlocking some of this mystery and considering how credit for prior learning for military connected students can be made easier at the institutions. And we're so pleased to be hosting them today for this webinar. In addition to the folks who are presenting today, I want to share my gratitude for the other ACE staff that have been strong partners with our work in Michigan's Military Equivalency Project, um, and just let you know that we're in good hands. My experience with ACE is that the staff are highly dedicated to serving military-connected students, and they are enthusiastically ready to help us. So thanks for being here, ACE, and take it away. Wonderful. Well, thank you so very much for the wonderful introductions. My name is Michelle Spires. I'm the Director of Military Programs for the American Council on Education. Home for me is Colorado Springs, not Washington, D.C. And I have to go ahead and make my confession now. I am a military spouse. My husband is retired Air Force. And since we're in this audio cast where you can't dialogue with me, but you can use the chat function to post questions, or you can use the raise a hand function, how many veterans, military spouses, or military connected personnel do we have and participants? Go ahead and show me a raise a hand function. I know you can multitask. Let me see those hands. Pa oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Nice. I want to thank you for your service today and for joining in the conversation. I brought a wonderful colleague with me. Tracy, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? You can all lower your hands now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tracy Mosier. I am from Lake Superior College in Duluth, Minnesota, 
And typically we're known for our cold, harsh climate, so it's warmed up. We're happy here. It's been a lot nicer. My background is teaching primarily in the nursing program, and I teach at multiple levels, at the LPN level, advanced standing track level, and also associate degree level. So nursing is my forte, and um, we've worked really hard to embed uh, military curriculum into our, our college. But more importantly, or not more importantly, but as importantly, I am a, a dedicated ACE uh, faculty reviewer, and I have been blessed to be able to go on uh, multiple different reviews at both the corporate and the military level and have learned uh, an immense amount and have uh, a greater deep, um, respect for everybody that is teaching in the United States at, in higher ed. So, I'll, so see, I'll I actually brought a... Yourself. Yeah, I brought a secret weapon weapon with me so that we could really dig into this conversation. Uh, but to get us started, uh, just when you thought you were going to sit back with a bucket of popcorn and your soda, you actually have to participate with us. We, we have a quick poll here, and what we would like to know, getting us started here, is um, tell, tell us who you represent. Where are you coming from? And I think we can go ahead and... Uh, have a poll coordinator jump in for a technical assist and show us the results that are coming in. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Lots of academic units, student advising, transcript, staff coming in. Let's move to the next question and see what we've got here in terms of on your campus, with which academic departments are you finding your military-affiliated students working? Where are they spending their time? Business, criminal justice, you don't know. Let's see what we've got coming in here. What academic departments represent the most activity with your military connected community? Gives us a little bit of insight. Oh, we see those coming in. A lot of criminal justice, a lot of business, a lot of computer. I promise I didn't write the um, top three as the response. And our final question before we jump in and get started with which military service does your institution primarily interact? You know, there's usually some top areas, depending on where you're located, um, of branches of service. And we know, by default, Army being the largest service, that they tend to take the lead in these. But sometimes, you never know, the Navy comes and shines through, especially when you get to that Norfolk Tidewater, Virginia area. All right, seeing lots of... Uh, high numbers for the Army. Well, let's jump in because one of the things we want to do is talk about how does ACE come up with the credit recommendations. And as a bit of point of history, ACE is located in Washington, D.C., and we were formed in 1918, as you see on the pie chart there, to really support those World War I veterans who were leaving their service and getting them reentry into the workforce. So history has really kind of come back around um, as we're looking at our veterans today and supporting their transition into the workforce, their service members to veterans transition, or into the academic world of finishing credentials, degrees, and whatnot. Now, ACE is formed on leadership and advocacy. It is focused on higher education institutions. But underneath the big umbrella of ACE is the Center for Education, Attainment, and Innovation. And I'm coming at you directly from the Military Evaluations Program, which is where I spend most of my time um, working with this contract. We have some sister programs with our corporate evaluations. And what I want to do is plant the seed. I know you can raise your hand out there. How many of you have ever had Starbucks or McDonald's or have heard of the FAA? Come on, let me see some raise of hands out there. Oh, yeah. They also have corporate training programs. So Tracy and I are going to talk to you today about the rigor and integrity with which the review process occurs for courses to help you understand how the credit recommendations appear. Thanks for raising your hands and for playing. You can go ahead and lower those. To do that, the American Council on Education for the military evaluations piece of it is on a contract. This contract is managed through the Department of Defense through Don's Hayes. Now, point of clarification, I'm going to use the term service member to really make sure that we're talking about those individuals who are currently serving and the term veteran to talk about those individuals who have already made a transition. I will not use them interchangeably. 
Sometimes I'll talk about Military Connected, which may include service members, veterans, your family members, your spouses, whoop, whoop, like I am, um, to kind of capture the whole target audience. The important thing is that the Department of Defense, through the Dante's contract, has been managing this contract since the mid-1950s. And there are criteria for eligibility. That means not every course that is, that is being delivered by each branch of service can be evaluated. In other words, each branch of service has a liaison to the contract, and they determine what it is that needs to be evaluated. Hear me roar from Colorado, ACE does not pick and choose the courses to be reviewed. And there are criteria. They have to be at least 45 academic hours. There have to be assessments, individual assessments. We all know from colleges and universities that there is pressure on how you are assessing the learning that is occurring in the courses. And we also know that we have to have firm identification of the student in terms of those individual assessments for distance learning. So how are you sure, you, the military, that the soldier, the service member, the veteran, is who they say they are when they go to take an examination? So we put the proof in the pudding to that through our process requirements. Now the contract is also based on the enlisted get first priority. Then we move to the limited duty officers and the teeny tiny top of priority in the scope of contract has to do with officers. Now, we do evaluate some Air Force courses. Here's the caveat. These Air Force courses cannot be connected to Community College of the Air Force. We do not touch or evaluate anything that has any affiliation with regional accreditation. So that is your background and your overview of ACE, kind of a basic framework on the contract. Let's dig in, jump in a little further to get an understanding of where you're coming from when we talk about courses and course transfer. So yep, time to play again. Get your clickers out. Question number one, does your academic institution have a policy in place to accept transfer credit recommendations for military courses? Yes? No? I have no clue. I don't know. Uh-huh. Look at those responses rolling in. We're going to start our conversation on the course evaluation process first. We're going to hear a model from Tracy especially, and then we will jump in and look at occupations. We're going to pay attention to time. All right. It looks like most of you do. There's a little bit of variance with not sure and I don't know. At the same next level, you can check all that apply. When you transfer that credit, and that credit is awarded and accepted, how is it being used? Are you looking at it as clean sweep free electives? Does it um, fall into major requirements or major related electives? Not sure how that works or how that process works? This is where we need some Jeopardy music to see the results as they're coming in. Taking a look here. Looks like we have a, a primarily free elective area, but some really good balance coming through, some major requirements, some major related. So pretty good in terms of balancing it out. Well done. So let's jump in. I'll make sure Tracy's unmuted so that she can join us in this part of the conversation. So first part, how does ACE come up and conduct the course review? You know, what's the process? And the burning questions I normally get from the field are, how are the courses evaluated, and how can you, the academic institutions, really make sure you can trust the credit recommendations? So we're on a very tight schedule. We plan out well over a year in advance on the contract. All five service have to collaborate in scheduling. Now, I've been told there's only 52 weeks in a year, uh, and there's only four of us that can lead teams on the military side. We are generally on travel 48 weeks of the 52 weeks of the year. We receive course planning tools. Some of you may have heard of a program of instruction. Um, the Navy calls it a training course control document. What we like to do is call this a syllabus on steroids. This is the planning document or the resource document on what is being taught in the course. So on an administrative processing side, we get to look at what is the content areas, what are the learning outcomes. Military courses can be deceiving. The title of a military course may not make any sense whatsoever. 
So we use the Department of Education's the US, the Classification of Instructional Program codes to determine what content is in that military course. So you may have a gun mount system that comes through, and that gun mount system may have troubleshooting and repair. There may be computer systems. There may be nothing related to munitions. In fact, there may be some business and administration that's in factored in. Once we've identified the content within that course, looking at the course planning documents, we identify a faculty team with the similar background. It is all about what the faculty evaluators are teaching not their academic degrees, but what it is they are teaching to look at the courses for review. We do a lot of logistics to get them into the field. And they get to go into these fun military installations and look at what are the instructor materials, what are the student materials, what are the assessments. They're digging into real analysis. They get to see the plan, course planning documents as well as kind of a road map. But the proof is in validating all of those other moving parts and pieces. Tracy can chime in. She's been in the war room on the military side. I have. If you look here, it's heavy paper, a lot of our paper. Sometimes we get computers, but most of it is. This is one course right here where the Marines rolled in from Fort Leonard Wood and slapped up on the wall a hazmat course, about 500 hours. So when the team is digging into the instructor materials, the student materials, and the assessments, they're collaborating. And they're using Bloom's Taxonomy as a guiding tool. It, it's you know, a way to kind of assess what learning is occurring in this course and how is that learning being measured and assessed. And Tracy can attest to this. She'll hear it once. She'll hear it 50,000 times. Content scope and rigor must be at the post-secondary level. Right, the breadth and, and depth of curriculum. And, and I think it's so important that all of the people coming in, it's amazing that you had mentioned that they're, they're instructors in their area of specialty, but they're really, even beyond that, they're really subject matter experts that ACE has looked at and brought in specifically to certain reviews that really complement that. And I think that's important, too. They're really sometimes even be up, up, above and beyond, you know, in their instruction um, and their exemplars at their institution, and, they, and that's how they kind of move through and are recommended. Tracy, I think that's a great point because when we're bringing faculty to the table, we're also looking at what levels they're teaching, you know, at the vocational certificate all the way up, you know, through the graduate. We're diversifying the faculty team from, you know, north, south, east, west, the types of institution, public, private, for-profit, not-for-profit, the different regional authorities, so that we don't have a myopic look at the assessment of course content. So credit recommendations can be made at vocational certificate. Uh, what we find is the majority of the credit recommendations fall within the lower division and the upper division level. Sometimes, very rarely, do we see credit recommendations at the graduate level. Um, but when we do, um, it's highly specialized, highly technical, and they're definitely the military education and training locations are making that ex that expectation of graduate rigor as we would consider on an academic side of the house. So when the teams are in the field digging in, uh, and Tracy can chime in, she's going to share with us some of her team collaboration experience. We are really focusing in on the accountability of learning. And the teams have to come to consensus. So in a military course, it can be 45 hours, it can be 1,500 academic hours. So if you think about three faculty evaluators have to come to consensus on a final write-up, what if the course has five unique subject areas? Well, now you're talking 15 faculty evaluators have to come to consensus on what the military calls one course. I mean, can I get some hand clapping going on that we can facilitate <laughs> faculty to come to consensus, 100% consensus on a final write-up? And oh, by the way, we give them some number two pencils and a blank collaboration tool called a team consensus sheet. They are producing a product. They are doing the analysis. They're not taking the word of the training and education locations on the military. This is what we're doing. They're digging in and determining that. So the rigor is there. 
So we always take new faculty in the field with us, but we marry them up with other faculty evaluators who have also served on reviews. Our faculty do not have to be military at all. In fact, in some cases I really prefer that they don't have any military background at all because they also have to serve as translators. There's a shared definition of terms. Um, there's some rubrics for how to conduct the review in terms of digging into the different components of courses with their course planning, instructional materials, assessments, and they're really collaborating. So Tracy, would you give a little intel behind the scenes of what to. happens in the war room? <laughs> yeah. So I think to begin with, it's important that um, when when your team is coming together, in my experience, that we have team meetings ahead of time. And it's very clear that ACE establishes both the paperwork and just the support that's needed to the team, but there's a very strict adherence to the process, making sure that that process is held to, and you just reviewed some of the paperwork that's included into that. As the review process begins, there's a lot of validating the job standards that are established by whatever branch of service that you're working with. And it's not uncommon for there to be like an interview panel with service members um, to help understand where they're coming from and vice versa, you know, with the team. So we often are provided, or almost always provided, with an occupation description, occupation standards, job task analysis, um, any exams or manuals that the service person may be using at that time. And then we take that information and move it through our team to provide, you know, work as a team to allocate those credits. We also bring the service members and the instructors back in to interview throughout the process if necessary so that we can talk to them and validate the responsibilities, the functions, the duties, and like whatever skills that they're outlining in their paperwork. It's just not there on paperwork, but we really want them to be able to articulate what the service member is doing so that we can um, make sure that what's on paper is what's in the field and what's going on. So. It seems like uh, when we're identifying those key components, we look at those responsibilities, skills, and requirements uh, for each occupation. But most importantly, we take them back and think about our experiences as subject matter experts and how it relates to learning outcomes at the college level as a whole. So Michelle had spoken about how we have, you know, associate degree credit allocations and, and bachelor. So many of the reviews that I have been on have been right in that sweet spot of, of that credit allocation. Um, I think I that's think a really that, good point because what you illuminated for us, Tracy, is that really the military is educating and training to meet their mission requirements. Now, they're not educating and training to meet post-secondary rigor. So we're there to bridge the gap. So we have to dig into that deep dive analysis, and when I say we, you, the faculty evaluators, and understand in this particular course, you know, you identify these learning outcomes, you identify these methods of assessment, what I'm, what I'm seeing or not seeing, and then also translate what, you, what they're using in military world may have a civilian counterpart, but because there's a language difference. Sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, and that was a great point. I mean, that was a big deal for me when I sat um, on a review that was at Fort Sam. Having that interaction um, with the instructors and with the service members meant everything because they could decode some of it and create a better understanding for us to um, place those learning outcomes in, in credits appropriately. So it really it was a team effort kind of on both ends, both speaking with the military members, but then also, you know, our team then could take that information and meet again and then discuss it and collaborate. Um, it, and it, it is simply amazing the um, level of different instructors that you get to work with and faculty reviewers, like we had said, all the way from associate level up to doctorate. So the wealth of sharing of information is truly I mean, I haven't in all my years, and I've been an educator for 15 years, that, that um, there's a lot of steam coming out of those doors because there's a lot of thinking and collaborating going on. And that is also, um, in particular, we call it the war room because the faculty need room to have those kind of conversations. You know, there's no one taxonomy of what is management across the country, 
right? So they have to really dig in and say, if there is planning, leading, controlling, and organizing, the key tenant threads of a basic management type, of course, and they're looking at the alignment of credit recommendation, they all have to come up to con with consensus on the related topics, the competencies, and the learning outcomes that go with that management. Now, here's where lightning will strike us. The team is charged with looking at each course as a standalone product and aligning credit where credit is due, which means they can align partial credit recommendations. They can give one semester hour or two semester hours or three semester hours. Let's think of that military joint services transcript as an education portfolio for that service member or veteran. They may not be using it all for transfer and award of credit. They may be using it for resume development, for a job advancement, for transition to civilian world. So when you get frustrated, I know you do, and I can probably say, raise your hand when you get frustrated with the transcripts and the partial credits, and I will see yellow light up in our participant panel because there's only subject areas in onesies and twosies. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, but now you understand that the team's charge is to align credit where credit is due and to make those credit recommendations as appropriate, looking at the lens across the country and their academic discipline areas of expertise. So the faculty are key. Um, Tracy already said, you know, we pay for their travel, we give you an honorarium for the day, but, you know, that collaboration opportunity, kind of like that commercial, it's kind of priceless. Would you say that, Tracy? You know, it's the, wow, you get it's to learn priceless. from others. <laughs> and I think, too, we take it home. I mean, at the end of the day, when, when work isn't done, that, that evaluator might go directly back to their hotel room and work an additional two to three hours to be able to come back to the team again and speak to um, a, a, a particular area. So it, it's, I think it goes above and beyond. Like they, as evaluators, we are so dedicated to making sure at the end of the day that, um, that we're well understood and that the credits make sense. Now let's take a pause right here and look to our participant panel. Where are the faculty that are participating in this conversation today? Raise your hands. Let us see some yellow highlight out there. If you're currently teaching in uh, post-secondary curriculum, uh -huh, I see all of you highlighted. Now I want you to bookmark this, www.acenat.edu forward slash evaluators. Jump into our portal. Take a look. The tools and the eye candy we presented on the rubrics and the checklist and the definition of terms, everything is open source and available for you to take a look at. And probably the best way to get involved is to sign up to serve on reviews. Um, we don't call you every day. We call you when your subject area comes up. Uh, you can always say no. Um, and we will come back at you 10,000 times. We understand life gets busy, so the key is if you stop responding to our email inquiries, then we kind of blacklist you. But if you say no 10,000 times, we'll keep knocking on your door. We got it. So let's sum up because I really want Tracy to share with you a model um, that she's built um, at Lake Superior College. I want you to take a couple things away. One, the faculty evaluation or the course evaluation is a faculty-driven process. There has to be collaboration and consensus. It is not Michelle Spires sitting around in Colorado Springs or the airport, wherever she may be traveling to, drinking coffee and eating dark chocolate, coming up with credit recommendations by title. There is real rigor, breadth, and depth of analysis that is involved. We don't always align credit recommendations because this is about setting the service member or veteran up for success. Uh, we not want to align credit where credit is due. And it's also not just about, you know, how many hours are spent on, you know, Y topic to equal Z credit recommendations. We have to see the accountability in terms of the course materials and the assessment to align potential credit recommendations at the post-secondary level. So there is a due diligence for sure. So I am taking a pause moment, looking at questions that looks like we're caught up to date that are coming through. Remember, you can post chat questions for us, and we'll try to pop through them during our conversation. But let's transition. Tracy, I'm going to let you take it away and talk about the model that you built. It's so exciting. Perfect. Yeah, it is exciting. I First off, I just did want to add into that, that how we kind of came to this, and the next slide speaks to that a bit, saying that, um, 
the state of Minnesota has done a wonderful job of trying to get our veterans moved back into um, curriculum that lets them, in the end, get a degree. But it, there was a period of time that it was the White House task that issued like a National Governors Association. We met as a group and the, the pressure was really on to create a, educational programs that would give veterans credit for their prior experiences so that they didn't having to repeat previously acquired content. And I think that's the main thing. So we sat um, with a, a big group of individuals from the state of Minnesota and um, there wasn't a lot of takers uh, within the state that wanted to work on a new curriculum. And it was very specific to three areas. It was practical nursing, uh, peace officer, and then the EMS or emergency medical technician or paramedic. And um, our college and, and a bunch of my colleagues um, said, we can do it. We can take this on. We feel that the practical nursing, when we move uh, the medic into a practical nursing program, that there's a fit and we can make it work. So we we were the only ones in the state that did chose to participate in this initiative. And the next slide talks about um, what we really looked at. So it was 2014 that we started putting the program planner together. And we needed to come up with an idea as to what was the military medic, what had they already done and received some credit through ACE with, in addition to some of the transcripts that we had seen come through our, you know, our registrar and um, across our director's desk already. So we came up with 14 prior credit uh, learning credits that we gave that we felt they had already met those in our program when our outcomes, like they had kind of hit those already. So to be able to move on with the program planner and determine like how do you, you can, you can give these 14 credits, you know, and, and we have that understanding that they have met those requirements in those areas, but we still have a lot of curriculum left that we need to continue building on. So it's a total of 40 credits for the practical nursing program. And so we did use a couple of pieces of information. One was the fast track to civilian employment. We used that, this NCSBN, so it's the National Council of the State Board of Nursing. We used that article, and we also used an uh, NCSBN analysis was really a core piece. So I, I highly recommend if you're looking um, to build a curriculum and bring in credit for prior learning, find what resources are out there because there are a lot of great ones through the state that you're working with through MCMC, through ACE, through NCSBN that are really trying to promote working veterans up into, um, you know, t towards graduation. So this the analysis we looked at, it was a comparison of selected military healthcare occupation curricula with a standard licensed practical slash vocational nurse curriculum. So it took a while for us to move through this. So the, the state said, yep, go ahead and do it. We got some grant money that uh, we were able to work with a fellow colleague of mine, Jackie Simon. Her and I had about a total of 168 hours just in building the the curriculum and getting the program planner and getting it through approval, which took place in May of 2015. So dean directors, we had to get passed through our union, through the Academic Affairs and Standards uh, Council, and then eventually through Minnesota State Colleges and University System. So, so I, I have a quick question coming in for yep. you, Tracy. Um, yeah. uh, Joyce asked, which occupation was it where you found the 14 credits? Did you focus on the Army side? Were you balancing the Navy side too? Did you look at Coast no. Guard? Great question. No, that's a great question. So we looked at, we stuck with the medic, which is Army. So we really okay. looked, we had a lot in our area, in our region, we found that the 68 Whiskey um, was really the, the veteran that was coming to us knocking at our door saying, how can we get into your nursing program? How can we do this? And so we, we did focus on, because in our area that was most applicable. It seemed like that's, that, that was our consumer. That was who was interested in our program. Um, at the end, I'll talk a little bit more. I, I think there's other ways to broaden it, definitely, depending on you know, where you're located, your region, um, and whatnot. But in, in we were pretty lucky coming in to this, you know, our institution was already military friendly. 
Um, we've got a hugely dedicated administration and faculty that just threw open the doors for this and really wanted it to happen. And we've also been blessed with a physical therapy assistant program that had created a bridging program and was well established and kind of known nationally. So that all helped us. But there's always baby steps in, in getting, you know, the course, the medic, looking at the medic, what they've already done, and seeing where you can allocate credits and then move it into a curriculum. So um, we used a lot of standards. You know, our the, uh, we've already been accredited through the um, Accreditation Commission for Education and Nursing, ACEN. So that helped a lot. We looked at NCLEX blueprints um, to make sure that the frameworks uh, were the structure for defining nursing actions and competencies was already set in place. We worked and collaborated with the Minnesota Board of Nursing to do this as well. So it wasn't a silo. So I know in the beginning you had said, you know, this, how Tracy put this together, but I just really want to break that open and talk to how uh, collaborative that was just in our institution and how well supported it was by our dean, director, and even at the state level. So with the that, next that's slide. That's a great point. It takes a lot of people to do that. It does, and, and everybody has to be, um, have, you know, encouraging about it because you need that extra strength to keep moving through those 168 hours. You want to get it to fruition. You want to see it happen. Um, so these were some of the courses that we felt the medic had already, when we looked through the, the outcomes, had they met these. So adult nursing one is introductory uh, medical surgical nursing. We have nursing skills one. We look at sterile fields. We look at specimen collection. Medication concepts is, is introductory. So you can see that these all are like, you know, 1,000 level courses, meaning that they're in the first semester of the practical nursing program. We already felt, that we well, when we looked at their clinical hours and what they have done in practice within the military, clinical one and clinical two, they would have already had that interaction with patients, definitely. And so that credit was given as well. So there are a few areas that needed to be expanded. So the next slide I just wanted to narrow down how we said, okay, these work. These courses, that those, that's those 14 that they came in with. They still would need to have um, some biology courses, so they would have a human body and health disease or introduction to cell biology. But we do need um, ANP1 and then ANP2 as well and then some college comp. But when you're getting into the core courses, we felt that there were two big courses that needed to be established that really transitioned them um, into nursing practice and made them safe in a healthcare environment such as a hospital because things change so much um, when you're looking at applying some of the nursing theory and practice and that safety is a big component. So we took this NUPN, Nursing PN 15 uh, 05. It's a comprehensive adult nursing course. So we knew that the NCSBN article pointed to areas that needed to be expanded. So we looked at gerontology um, was a big piece of it, health promotion and prevention, uh, pediatrics, obstetrics, and just chronic conditions. So get, they get layered into this. But we also built in simulation. And we felt that military veterans do have good simulation experiences most often. And we wanted to layer that in with what they already knew. And we felt that it was important, too, to inventory them ahead of time and know their strengths and weaknesses so we could almost customize. And most of these courses um, were looking at small numbers. So we really wanted to be individualized. And so we used that simulation to build into it. And then we embedded the LPN scope of practice, which um, with the medic, they are often um, – Delegated tasks, which in civilian, you know, healthcare may not fit within the LPN scope of practice. So we felt that that was a very important aspect is maintaining them safely in that scope. And then we also have a comprehensive adult nursing lab course, which is a two-credit course, and it really totally bookended the comprehensive adult up above it. So when they were learning cardiac in one, we came down and we did heart sounds and looking at EKG strips. When we would do urinary system, we would talk about placing a Foley catheter. So all of those pieces were merged in so that the hands-on lab application that the medic was used to, there was a level of comfort in that. There were other courses, too, that they are partnered with. I don't have them up there right, right now, but they 
also would be partnered with the PN students, the practical nursing students who were going straight through, like traditional practical nursing, we would bring in the, um, these advanced medic standing bridging course students into uh, psych to, um, excuse me, into maternal child nursing and nursing trends. So there was also, they weren't all alone in their curriculum, but they were working with other practical nursing students and um, supported by them as well. And we felt that was very important. Well, and Tracy, so I think uh, you really gave some good examples of where it's maybe not a perfect fit because you talked about the ops tempo of an Army medic and the skills that they bring where there are maybe a variance there. Um, so thank you for sharing that as well. And, and they have a massive skill set. It's just how do you find that, that, where do you bring that into your curriculum? How do you give credit to that? And so we recognized those gaps and then worked, you know, to try and bring in um, nursing process. And like I said, so the ability to think like a nurse was important. So no matter what you're bringing the, um, the veteran into, I do think it's important to, you know, I, I think paramedic, there's fire. Um, so I, there's so many business I saw pop up as a, an important one. I just think they have a huge skill set that we can bring in and, and give credit for. But it's not without um, pitfalls and adjustments. So I just kind of wanted to, to end with this. So what we found that we could have really used some help on, and we're still trying to get the numbers in to make everything roll out smoothly. We found that there does need to be really good communication with the military to value these programs that have been established, and there needs to be some advertising. So what we're hoping to see more of is uh, better communication between the college systems and the military so that we're able to go to some of their job fairs. We're able to get into the uh, CAP program, the Transition Assistance Program, and just do more marketing because we can have this here all day long, but if we don't have the bodies to move into it, it's not, you know, it just doesn't make sense. So another piece to think about is that as people are looking at creating programs, that you consider how many credits needs to be in each semester for that veteran to be able to collect, you know, everything that they need for reimbursement. So in hindsight, we have a summer. This runs from spring to summer, and we found that our summers shy by one credit, and they need five, and it needs to be six. And so that's something that we need to work on and we need to correct, and that's, we've got that in the works. Um, also supporting students with additional resources. Go ahead. I was just going to say, it's while you're talking about the gaps and the connections and your lessons learned, uh, Sharon posted a quick question in the chat area about um, licensure with other states and partnerships that you have. How did that factor into some of the decision processing? Thanks for posting that, Sharon. Yeah, that's a good question. So if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, in the state of Minnesota, what we are trying to do is prepare our practical nursing students to be able to, to sit for the Minnesota um, board of is the NCLEX in the state of Minnesota. Now they could, um, you can take your board exam any in any state. So our students that are graduating through our, because um, we're ACEN accredited, um, they can sit for any NCLEX exam in any state. They could take multiple ones if they wanted to. So if they took their their coursework in Minnesota, they could go to Wisconsin and sit for their NCLEX examination, and that would be fine, and they would be prepared for that. And actually, it partners in wonderfully with what I think that is important thing students is being able to take tests that are NCLEX style. So we find resources. I think that if you're building something, make sure that you're using resources and products, and I don't want to get too specific as to, mm -hmm. you know, what what publisher, whatever to use. There's so many out there. Whatever you're using, make sure that it's folded into that. So, and then we also have a advanced standing track, so we can our practical nursing student that graduates can move into the RN program. And so we felt the need. There's other states which are doing a wonderful, wonderful job. Uh, Michigan, Indiana, I think Texas as well. And there's so many that I probably are not even aware of that are doing a great job across the United States, um, but we really felt that um, just having them ready for NCLEX and in sitting for boards and moving them into the RN and having that ability to move to the next level was very important. So 
I'm I'm open to questions if anybody has any. And I was just checking questions. the chat function um, to see where else questions are coming in. Mary Kay, I haven't forgotten you. We'll take you back to the course <laughs> review process here in just a second. Um, but any other questions that I should be looking for coming through the chat portal specifically um, for Tracy and for the model and the program that they have built. And again, I appreciate you taking the time to share lessons learned as well. Mm -hmm. I think there's you know, a lot of le a lot of devils in the detail, and sometimes that little detail can just make a, you know, a challenge um, in terms of moving forward. So, well, question coming in: Have you had any difficulty with students testing in Texas from another state? I not that I'm aware of, um, and I, I assume you're talking about the NCLEX exam. So maybe. Is if that's if I'm understanding that correctly. So we right. personally have had any issues with that at our institution. It might be a good broad question for, you know, I, I don't know if there's blogs out there or other people call, but we could. Uh, I could always check in with our veteran services as well. But I personally, we haven't. Interesting question, and, and there may be some follow-up required on that. So I think another good question to ask, especially because we talked about how you built it, leveraging the multiple resources that are coming in, but what were the roadblocks by nursing faculty, and you are one, um, that mm -hmm. you faced in terms of building this program? I think some of the roadblocks are when, whenever you're creating new curriculum, I am finding and is it's it's hard to get reimbursed for your time. And so you put gobs of hours into creating a new curriculum, and yet there isn't always the reimbursement for that. So I think it's important to work with grants within your state, um, and, and if you have a grant writer in your institution, so that faculty can be reimbursed for their time. And, and I know none of us who are faculty mind doing a certain amount to build, and we want that success for veterans and we want success for our students in general but I think that there has to be some a little bit of funding and reimbursement for that so I think that that was a roadblock um, and just finding the time because you're trying to do you know teach classes in it in addition um, another uh -huh. roadblock is that some of the faculty who didn't help create um, the, the program planner need to come in and be all in on it. And so there has to be a great amount of communication within the faculty to understand the end goal. And we were blessed enough uh, to have faculty members who were veterans, and so that made a big difference. The buy-in was huge there. But I think that finding faculty who have a passion, if you have a faculty of 10 or 12 people, you may only have three or four faculty who have a real passion for teaching veterans and really want to dive into that. And I think you have to find those um, those passionate people. So those That's are a couple great issues. Tip. Reimbursement in finding the passionate individuals who really want to take the extra time to for the success. So those were two so, just off the top of my head. There were more. <laughs> but this is the well, and I think of. that you're right on the money with that, with the faculty. And, and let's before we move into the occupation process and our next poll, hang tight, everybody. Mary Kay asked a really good question about how ACE focusing on the faculty evaluators. Um, and their, what they are teaching rather than their credentials. Here's our thought process. You, the regionally accredited academic institutions, have already vetted and approved faculty to teach your classes. So why reinvent the wheel? What we need is their subject area expertise. So sometimes you have somebody who might be a dean of engineering because they have a lot of faculty expertise in terms of their credentials, their degrees, but they happen to be teaching for the College of Business some business classes. We see that happen. So we're coding them based on their business credentials because they are approved at your institutions to teach those courses. So that's why we focus uh, faculty in that lens for both the course and the occupation review process. So I'm going to transition us just a little bit because now we're talking a little bit about apples and oranges on the banana meter in terms of how do we evaluate the occupations, the jobs. So the first question is, does your institution have a policy in place to accept credit recommendations for military occupations? Go ahead, yes, no, I don't know. The reason is we will see a variance of trends. Institutions that are, have mission and vision to accept credits from military transcripts 
typically are very comfortable with the course credit recommendations because the occupations are so much more experiential in nature, sometimes they limit that. So it looks like it's um, maybe not as robust. We'll move on to the next one, the next question here. So we got some yes, about 40, some no, I don't know, scrolling through. So if credit is awarded for occupations, how is it being used? Sometimes academic institutions limit. You can only use your occupation credit if it directly aligns with your background expertise and your program pathway. In other words, if you're an engineer and you're going to pursue an engineering degree, we'll take your credit recommendations. But if you're an engineer and you want to pursue you know, something tangential, project management, for example, we may not accept it. So this is a, a, a different nuance. It's something that you can look at as far as homework and takeaways. Um, by getting that faculty buy-in, by looking at your policies and what they convey and communicate. So let's talk briefly about how we conduct the occupation review process. And that Michelle, is... Michelle, this is Sarah. I just wanted to jump in and let you know um, it's a 10-minute warning mark. Thank you, Sarah. I'm watching that clock you for betcha. sure. I don't want to hold All anybody right, late. Awesome. So okay, why good. I want to share this really quickly because this is where we kick the Air Force out completely. Some of you have written policies, and this is a homework piece, what does your policy say, that specifically uses the language MOS. When we did the survey on who do you serve, that's great if you're serving the Army and the Marine Corps only. So we only work with the Army and the Marine Corps on enlisted levels and warrant officer levels. And it's at this point in time when we're validating what learning is occurring on the job above and beyond formal classroom training. When you get to the Coast Guard and when you're starting to work with the Navy, they don't call them an MOS. The Navy now calls it a Naval Occupation Specialty, NOS. They used to call it a rating, and the Coast Guard calls it a rating. There are lots of changes occurring. The team has to look at the job duties and expectations that are put forward by the branch of service and their, oh, let's put a civilian twist on it, shall we, their job descriptions. Now think about your job description. Raise your hand if your job description is perfect and fits everything you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, wait, I think, Tracy, can you hear him laughing out there? Because I think I can. And you yeah, think about the it. things that you, I know it, the things you've learned on the job. Um, that you didn't have any formal training for. I mean, and things might come to mind like how to use Banner or Datatel or PeopleSoft or how to deal with, you know, performance assessments or I went to college, BC. Some of you may be in the same boat, you know, before computers. You know, I had a typewriter. Woohoo! So the team has to look at the job duties and responsibilities as set forth by pay grade, Again, specifically if we're looking at pay grade for the Navy and for the Coast Guard, um, pay grade for the Marine Corps with their ground, and then by skill level for the Army. So they look at that, and then we take them on a road trip into the field where the service members are currently working. We're not taking them to a location where they're going to school because we want to talk to service members who are currently working at that pay grade or at that skill level. And we want to understand, is it the expectation of every E4, regardless of their duty location? Now, many times faculty panels are very large because you're going to have the technical side of faculty, and let's pick on airframe and mechanics since Tracy's been talking about medical, and we can, where you might have uh, A&P, electronics, engineers, and then you always have soft skills, right? Because as they go up in rank, they're doing a lot more with planning, leading, and controlling, and organizing. And the faculty panels have a conversation, here's a live example of one, where they're having a conversation with those service members currently working at that skill level or pay grade to validate the occupation expectations and the learning that comes above and beyond. It is not individualized. Then the team has to come to 100% consensus on the alignment of credit recommendations, which means truly the technical team has to convince the soft skills team and vice versa on where the credit recommendations and the related competencies have to come into play to align credit recommendations. 
That is your Fast and Furious overview on the occupation review process. Again, it's much more experiential in nature because the documents and manuals that we see are highly complex and also typically incorporate military training along with the job duty expectations. And we're trying to factor that out. We don't want to know what you learned in a school. We want to know what you learned the individual and as an E4, E5, E6 at that pay grade or skill level above and beyond. Now each branch of service, this is a resource for you, has a credentialing opportunities online where they're working to make a general description of the job duties and expectations and then connecting it to the Department of Labor Workforce to help that service member transition to veteran status to align potential job skills and workforce competencies. This may be a tool as you're looking at that institutional intel. Tracy illuminated that's how they started by identifying the Army medic. That's who was knocking on their door. As you're looking at who's knocking on your door and attending what degrees and what programs, this may become a helpful tool in that process. So with that, we're going to skip the last set of poll questions because I want to illuminate for you specifically there were some questions coming in about resources that are available. Raise your hand on the far left side and participants if you're working with the Joint Services Transcript on a day-to-day -day basis. Let me see those yellows out there. Anybody playing with those transcripts? Oh, yeah. And as you know, they are highly complex. And the reason I say it's highly complex is because ACE makes the credit recommendations and we house that in a guide called the Military Guide. Each branch of service has their own registering system. They also have a data system that houses the individual's records. So think about the registering system as like your banner or your PeopleSoft. All three of these data points have to align perfectly in order for the credit recommendations to appear on that transcript. So the number one question we get is, is the JST official? And my answer is yes, because of the validation process, because each branch of service still owns their own transcript, and because we do such diligence on supplying the data and quality assuring checking. Now a question came in, is there a place where you can find out what's been evaluated Absolutely. It's called the Military Guide. And you can search that Military Guide to really get an understanding of courses. Some of you have currency policies. When you do a search, you can search by um, the ACE identifier, which is located on the transcript. Or if you just want to see how busy we've been, you can search by the team review date and populate a report. And you can pull that report and then export it to Excel. That's a lot of information in a very short period of time. I only wanted to plant seeds because I actually do whole workshops and webinars on dissecting the transcript, how to use the military guide, how to read a course exhibit, which has also been evolving and changing because you, the colleges and universities, have said, hey, we need more details in the faculty evaluators' write-ups in the field. So yes, please try to get 15 faculty evaluators to come to consensus, and please get them to detail it out so it looks more like a college syllabus. And that's where we are today. So with that, as we're moving forward and coming into our final wrap-up, oftentimes service members and veterans themselves are not even familiar with their own tool, their own credit recommendations. That's why we have to do this collectively as a group and share resources and communicate with one another on models that exist. This is a tool that was written to the service member or the veteran, literally gives them definitions on what's admissions, what's a registrar. So it's something you can bookmark and reference when you're working with your um, service members and your military connected community. So in the last two minutes, I'm going to jump right ahead. We're going to focus on uh, final questions, um, looking in our chat box. I think we've fairly well covered everything. I see one coming in from Chris with your biggest issues that the JST courses are all pass-fail, and that's a great question. If you go to that military guide, what you will see is definition on the new exhibit that shows what is the pass rate for that course. 
That is the expectation. Remember, the military is educating and training to meet their mission. They are not educating and training to say, oh, you made an A, oh, you made a B. So that is something that we have now posted with the new exhibit version. All right. Other questions popping through. Tracy, do you see anything coming in that you need to address specifically from your model? I don't think there's anything specific to the nursing piece. I might have missed it, but I'll go back up and review here in the meantime, but I don't think so. Great. So, Stephen, you said, right, one and two credit courses. Sometimes what colleges and universities will do is look at and you have to read. This is why the military guide becomes so critical in order to read a full exhibit of the related competencies and the learning outcomes that align with subject areas. So you may have an individual learner that has management on their transcript. They'll have taken maybe two or three different types of courses where there's management credits, and they may have management credits in their occupation. So the question to you when you're thinking about that individual learner, can you bundle those credit recommendations, it may total six or seven semester hours altogether, and award that individual three semester hours for management? Do they know a little something, something about management? And does it fit the definition of your institution's management? So Sarah, I'll turn it back over to you for the final wrap up. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, you may reach out to uh, us here at MCMC, and we'll try to get you uh, your questions answered. Uh, again, the um, PowerPoint slides will be on the website, and you can uh, look at those, as well as you can hear the audio from the web presentation as well. Katie, Jim, do you have any closing thoughts? Just thanks uh, again. No, thank you very much. For, yeah, go ahead. I would just say thank you very much to ACE for doing this. I see a couple more questions that I can do a quick answer on as I'm also a faculty reviewer. And one of the questions is how long does it take? Well, I don't know about the prep work for ACE, but at the faculty side, depending on how much is there, it's two, three, four, even five days uh, cranking through the paperwork and trying to gain consensus among the faculty and then the question, how do you get buy-in to the credit recommendations by faculty? Well, uh, I think it's consensus on the ground right there. And if there's an assumption that everyone gets credit, it's not the case. Um, right. there, there are courses very regularly that are, are given no credit or uh, recommended for no credit or sent back and said that you don't have enough to meet college level. So we're working really hard to keep this thing uh, uh, legit and then make sure that we're not putting any of the institutions in sort of some sort of bind with their accrediting agencies. These courses are good. And with that, I, I pass it back. It's Katie. I was just saying thank you. Um, and also, look out for us on the road. Several of us are presenting. Um, I'm presenting this week at the National Institute for the Study of Transfer Students on the same topic. And some of us will be at the CCME conference as well. So we'll look forward to seeing you all on the road. And thanks for being here today. All right. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you taking the time out today. Have a good afternoon.